Here is uh, Dr. Tim Klein from the Mayo Clinic, and he will talk about the next generation uh, kidney volumetric measurement for ADPKD. Uh, Tim. <clears throat> Well, I wanted to say a big thanks to York for uh, inviting me out here. Um, also, a big thanks to Winnie for uh, helping with scheduling and finding me a place to sleep. It's much appreciated. I also really appreciate the agenda. I don't need to give PKD background or really motivate the utility of radiological imaging in this space. Uh, so hoping to talk about uh, some of the background on things that we've worked on, uh, what we're currently doing today, and then uh, potentially some ideas for the future as well. Uh, so really the goal of, I guess, myself and my lab is to improve and increase the information that's obtained from a radiological exam. Uh, so there's a number of ways that we do this. Um, one is through automation. Uh, that's a large part of what I'm going to be talking about today. And really, uh, the goals here are to increase speed, improve accuracy, reproducibility, and ultimately standardize measurements. And as you've seen, uh, total kidney volume has been established as an imaging biomarker in uh, PKD. Uh, so one of the main things that we've worked on um, is to automate this process and also validate uh, the tools that we uh, develop. We also uh, work a fair amount on classification type of tests, and this is really uh, getting at trying to increase the amount of data that's available uh, in order to provide optimal diagnostic and prognostic criteria. So in the space of uh, PKD, you know, one of the questions we really have is how do we go beyond uh, total kidney volume and provide uh, more personalized uh, uh, biomarkers for our patients that could help us, you know, further improve upon, for example, the, the Mayo imaging classification. And the last piece, and I'll actually highlight a bit about this in my talk today, is really the validation piece. So this is to evaluate uh, as well as develop new image acquisition and image processing methods. So I wanted to give a bit of a background on, on what we've done in the space of automation. So we've already seen uh, really the importance of being able to measure uh, total kidney volume. And as uh, Karosh highlighted, you know, this is a very time consuming task. Uh, so nobody really wants to have to sit down, trace kidneys, uh, which can take on the order of 30 minutes to even an hour, uh, depending on the severity. So one thing we had worked on originally was developing a semi-automated tool for uh, performing these measurements, which essentially uh, made a user just provide some crude information about where the kidneys were on just a handful of the slices within the MR exam. And then we used image processing techniques to capture a full segmentation of the kidneys throughout the whole volume. So this allowed us to take the process of segmentation from an hour down to just a matter of minutes. The next thing that we worked on was then automating follow-up segmentation. So say a patient's already come in for an exam, they've had a segmentation performed, how can we automatically track uh, the changes that have occurred for that patient? I'm sorry, the I think the uh, animation maybe started halfway through, uh, but basically the idea was that we could uh, essentially align the, the follow-up scan to the prior exam uh, in order to then basically propagate that segmentation onto the follow-up examination. So now we had a tool that any follow-up exam, we could automatically capture uh, their total kidney volume at that time, as well as look at uh, tracking changes that were occurring. But really what this allowed us to do was then uh, develop a very large data set of imaging as well as reference standard segmentations to do a fully automated uh, segmentation model. So we developed a convolutional neural network model that was trained on the images and the segmentations to fully uh, and automatically segment the kidneys. And this we published uh, back in 2017. So one thing I want to highlight today is really what we've done since then um, in terms of trying to clinically adopt some of these tools, uh, particularly at our institution at Mayo Clinic. Um, obviously, uh, there's a lot of extensions that we can do beyond this. So we uh, work together uh, with Ron Gansevoort's group uh, in the Netherlands to then uh, go further and also automate the uh, measurements of liver uh, volumes as well. 
Um, and obviously a lot of this work, a lot of you know, the way that we tackle these problems is applicable in not only uh, clinical imaging, but also preclinical uh, imaging as well. And I just wanted to highlight, um, you know, we're also working uh, in areas outside of uh, necessarily the radiology space, but also working to automate measurements that are performed in histology or uh, organ cultures as well to do things like automatically measure cystic index. Uh, I think we touched a fair amount on this uh, in the last talk by Karosh about uh, also establishing other imaging techniques for uh, measuring total kidney volume. So we've also uh, been investigating 3D ultrasound for this task, uh, working again on developing automated tools to perform the segmentations. Uh, similar to uh, what was found here, we also saw you know, this under uh, representation of the volumes by ultrasound. Uh, but I think the point that York made uh, was a really good one about, uh, you know, there's very rarely are they crossing over in their classification and it might be uh, more relevant for the milder uh, disease patients in terms of uh, those associated errors. Um, in terms of classification, so I wanted to touch on the fact that you know we're also trying to look at how we can use imaging to go beyond uh, measurement of total kidney volume for instance trying to do things like characterize uh, fibrosis non-invasively um, so we've worked on both animal models as well as uh, in the clinical setting uh, to try to establish new mr uh, imaging techniques uh, to not only characterize you know healthy parenchyma but also potentially microscopic cyst burden as well as fibrosis uh, we extended that work that we were doing in the preclinical setting uh, to look at uh, how uh, these measurements could be reproduced, uh, both in healthy volunteers as well as a cohort of young uh, PKD patients, and also looked at um, the utility uh, of these measurement techniques uh, in the setting of PKD, and I'm going to touch more on this. Um, and then the final uh, classification um, method I just wanted to highlight was, you know, one thing we're also doing is really trying to see how we can utilize a lot of this retrospective imaging data to pull out more information from the scans. And so something that we have looked at is a radiology technique uh, called radiomics or texture feature analysis, uh, which essentially uh, could be a way to uh, bring out more information from an individual scan, for example, characterizing, you know, cyst size distributions uh, or potentially other uh, burdens on the kidneys like fibrosis as well. Uh, validation. So this is one thing I wanted to highlight, and I'll go into some more detail, um, but we've uh, clinically implemented the TKB uh, algorithm at Mayo Clinic um, actually over the last few years. Um, so I'm going to touch uh, a bit on uh, the results that we found really looking at prospectively evaluating the tool, trying to assess if there's, you know, particular patient populations that maybe the algorithm doesn't perform as well on uh, and these type of questions. Um, we're also working on external validation of the tools. So we've worked with Alan Yu's group. We're working with uh, Dr. Pei's group as well um, to externally uh, validate uh, a lot of these tools that we developed. Um, so actually, probably my quiz questions can be answered if you paid attention to Karosh's. So uh, just a heads up there that, that if lunch is out there, you know. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to highlight, you know, obviously there's many different ways to, to measure total kidney volume. Um, we've touched on, you know, the ellipsoid stereology as well as segmentation. And really, we feel that MR, you know, with planimetry or segmentation, uh, those are uh, interchangeable uh, words is really the the way to be the most accurate and pot potentially reproducible with the measurements. So in clinical practice, uh, what we've uh, now developed is is a tool for our radiologist to quality check. Uh, the outputs of the algorithm. So from our PAX viewer, um, our radiologists uh, can actually uh, trigger uh, sort of this web browser that gives an overlay of uh, the output of the algorithm. So total kidney volume, right, left, uh, as well as liver volumes. 
and then they can scroll through all of the slices uh, of the MR exam and actually see the output or overlay of the segmentation to do a quality review. And after they review it, they can uh, accept it and then it'll populate our PAC system or they can uh, send it for rework. So for example, if say a liver uh, cyst was attributed to the right kidney, uh, it can potentially be sent back for a, for a uh, uh, technologist to correct that segmentation, finalize the report, and then Dr. Torres is happy, right? <laughs> uh, so this is just an example then of, of what uh, we see then in our, our viewer. You can see the color overlays uh, for the liver, the kidneys, as well as the output metrics that are provided um, and automatically then populated into the radiology report. So this clinical implementation had a really long road. I mean, we looked at 2016, the algorithm was developed, um, and then it was actually the first AI tool at Mayo Clinic that uh, radiology wanted to put into the practice. And you can see that not until you know mid-2019 did we really start the process of trying to get this uh, into our clinical practice. I'd just like to highlight then that essentially a year ago, we then added the output of the liver metrics um, and have had that now sort of in production for the last year. So what I wanted to highlight then was uh, particularly the cases that were sent to get corrected, because I think that's what's uh, of the most interest. A large majority of these are just accepted um, and then put into the report. But we're going to talk a bit about uh, these, these cases that get flagged, what were the issues, et cetera, um, because this is a big component of trying to roll out these tools into the practice. So you can see over the last year, um, we actually did this enterprise-wide, meaning it's actually running at our Rochester site, Florida and Arizona. Uh, we had 59 different radiologists that are touching the uh, output of the algorithm. We had 31 different clinicians that are ordering it. Um, and obviously the majority of those orders are coming from nephrology. So then we looked at um, the cases that were sent for rework, meaning there was something that the radiologist didn't like um, and wanted corrected. And what we were interested in is basically how, you know, what was happening with the algorithm there. So we then pulled those cases um, so this is only analyzing the, the rework cases, and you can actually see that even though they got touched up, actually the mean percent difference was essentially 0%. So they, you can see there's some variability in terms of the precision there, um, but really the, we only had nine cases that were greater than what we consider the inner observer variability, so essentially two different readers performing the segmentation. So actually that's essentially performing at the level of inner observer just looking at the cases that get flagged. Um, if we look at total liver volumes, um, again here um, maybe a slight uh, bias in the difference but still less than one percent. Um, and then uh, the other point is only five of the cases had a, a difference of greater than ten percent. So then, you know, what were the reasons that this was sent for rework? Um, there were, were some that I would consider major reasons. For example, part of hepatic lobe is missing in liver segmentation. Uh, some that are more minor, like liver is a little bit overly included. These are comments that we're able to have the radiologist provide when they send it for rework. But we also had cases that were what I would, well, we would consider out of scope. For example, the algorithm gets ordered on a patient with, a, you know, double nephrectomy. Um, so then they wanted the transplanted kidney volumes, right? So, I mean, the algorithm had never really been trained to do this. And the other thing is, uh, you know, things like horseshoe kidneys. We have some logic in our algorithm to differentiate right from left, et cetera. Uh, so that obviously becomes more complicated in those settings. Um, so digging a little bit deeper into, you know, what potential variables could bias the algorithm. So we did a fair amount of digging into clinical uh, information, you know, looking at sex, looking at height, looking at BMI, as well as uh, information within actual image uh, header information. So how the image was acquired, uh, et cetera. And so what we saw was 19 out of the 21 of these continuous uh, variables did not show any significant bias uh, between accept and rework. 
and the two um, that potentially had uh, some bias, one was age. So we actually saw a slightly older population, which we would anticipate slightly you know, more severe patients ended up going for rework uh, more than the younger. I don't know if this is, well, and then uh, the other was uh, a reconstruction diameter. But actually both of these, when we um, corrected for false discovery rate, weren't uh, significant anymore. But I would say the, I think the age distribution is a little bit telling there. Uh, and then in terms of our categorical uh, variables, uh, 27 out of the 28 did not show any significant bias. Um, but what was actually really interesting was the one that did was the reading radiologist. So what we actually found was there was one radiologist who accepted once and sent it for re rework eight times. So when I showed this to the radiologist team, they said, okay, we need to have a meeting because there's an education opportunity here, right? But my first question was, okay, is, is this radiologist just happened to get all the bad uh, cases, for, for example? But you can see when we analyzed just their rework cases, again, it was actually you know, some of the cases that really didn't have very large uh, percent differences. So I think this is really interesting just about that idea of inter-readers and you know, what they would consider acceptable criteria, et cetera. So, so they're, a, they're a hard one to, to satisfy. <laughs> um, you know, so in terms of feedback, just a quick comment is that, you know, the radiologist feedback so far has been, you know, that it's been a really quick turnaround of the results. Uh, we have a, a nice interface for them to review the volumes and they're quickly able to update the PAC system and provide uh, the information to our clinicians. And the clinicians then, you know, can use these volumes they're ready for their appointments and counseling. And you know, the thought is that this makes a big difference on how they're able to counsel the patients, uh, which from my perspective is, is uh, really nice to, to see these tools being able to be adopted. Uh, so with that, um, I wanna kind of start going a bit beyond uh, total kidney volume. Um, so something we've been working on um, is to look at, you know, again, how can we pull out more information um, from each of these uh, scans? And I talked a little bit about, you know, what we're doing with quantitative MR as well as uh, newer image processing techniques like image texture. Uh, something else we've been working on is, you know, not only segmenting uh, the kidneys, but actually individually uh, segmenting the cysts so we can do things like uh, calculate the cyst numbers, uh, cyst size distributions, et cetera, and really try to provide more quantitative information uh, about the patient. Um, so I wanted to touch on uh, the development that we've done for a fully automated uh, instance level segmentation of the cysts. Um, I should probably check how I'm doing on time. Am I good? Okay. All right. um, so so we worked on developing an automated uh, instance cyst segmentation method, which essentially means uh, for each one of the cysts, we're individually uh, labeling them. Um, and I, from, you know, if we thought about TKV being laborious, uh, this took days of, of time to generate even a segmentation for one of the cases. So I think I didn't make many friends with, with this uh, project. But really, I think you know this opens up that opportunity to do things like cis counting, cis number distribution, uh, cis uh, volume distributions as well. Um, so just to quickly kind of touch on how we went about developing it, and you'll probably see some th similarities like what we did with TKV. Um, but we took a, an active learning approach, which just means let's get a small subset of data curated, let's train some initial AI models, and then let's quality check them to form our full reference uh, standards. So again, we have our initial model that was trained on 25 MRs. We get our initial segmentations. Uh, we actually had two readers performing uh, quality checks uh, to finalize uh, those segmentations and ultimately built our model uh, using 60 cases. Uh, so here's just the workflow um, for how we went about that then. So we started with our MR images. Uh, we had an initial cyst segmentation model and that essentially just segments the cysts as being one class and everything else as something else. So from a from that standpoint, you can get something like cis volume, but you can't get something like cis number. That's an important point, just a flag. Um, 
So the, uh, the initial uh, cis segmentation uh, method gave us something like this. And then we performed some basic uh, image processing to get an initialization for our individual cis and then ultimately use that, ultimately Q quality check that to get the final segmentation that we trained our model on. I won't go too much into the data set, um, but one point, um, if anybody's working in this space, is we did do a stratification of the data in order that our training and validation set well captured sort of the distribution that we see uh, in the patient population. So you can see how we uh, stratified our training and validation based on total kidney volume, and then how our test set uh, fit within that distribution for evaluating the model. And so here's just an example. So essentially our model takes as input the MR image and the kidney segmentation mask, and then uh, generates what we call this edge core at the top uh, right, which is essentially training the model on the inside of the cyst as well as the cyst surface. And from that, we can do some post-processing to then get our instance level segmentation. Um, so here's just some examples. So here's basically three different uh, patients, as well as the output from uh, two of the readers, uh, the automated, and then the automated uh, 3D visualization that we can do. One important point is the coloring really doesn't matter. It's essentially arbitrary, um, but you can see uh, essentially how, you know, the two different readers can sometimes uh, e either merge or, or uh, differentiate uh, the CIS as well as uh, how the automation compares uh, visually. Uh, something that we found interesting then was we, um, you know, compared the different readers uh, as well as the automation approach. So you can see in A, essentially, this is our inner observer variability in trying to measure cis number in this cohort. And then uh, in B and C is the comparison of the automation to the individual readers. And in D is the average of the two readers. So an interesting result here and something that we've seen in other studies is typically the AI models end up learning to sort of generalize to, you know, multiple readers. So actually, it's not too surprising that it compared most favor favorably to if we just average the output of the two readers, um, which is, is uh, certainly promising. So with that, you know, now we've developed a new tool uh, to extract additional imaging biomarkers that we didn't really have access to before. Uh, so one thing that we looked at then was what is the utility of these biomarkers, for example, in the CRISP cohort. So we took the baseline CRISP images uh, where we had 232 baseline T2MR images. Uh, we had to exclude some cases for performing this analysis based on quality, uh, but ultimately you can see we had 208 cases with good quality images. And then what we did was we looked at that eight year follow up to start to see, you know, does something like cis number uh, reflect better or predict better uh, those subsequent changes in uh, renal function. Uh, so here, um, this is work. Um, sorry. So in the in the left uh, uh, column, we essentially have uh, height adjusted total kidney volume, and showing then in the top uh, its relationship with change in EGFR, and then in the bottom uh, its relation with slope in EGFR. And as we walk across, we kind of look at uh, the different imaging biomarkers. So you can see uh, in the second column we have total cyst volume. The third is total cis number, and then the last one is uh, the cis parenchyma surface area. So I think of note really, and we've kind of heard a bit about this in the previous talks, but essentially what we're trying to do is improve that prediction power. Um, and you can see something like cis number um, is doing a much uh, stronger job of predicting that subsequent change uh, in renal function. And I think this uh, figure actually highlights this really well because uh, what we're looking at really on what I would say on the top are example cases where uh, potentially total kidney volume isn't uh, enough of the story, right? You can look at the top right, and uh, as Karosh highlighted, right, we have uh, fairly large uh, 
cysts, probably a lot of healthy uh, renal parenchyma. But if you just base your model on total kidney volume, you would essentially predict the same change as that bottom right. But I think from a clinician perspective, you can anticipate there's a, uh, gonna be a fairly uh, different trajectory for those patients. So if we look at the left panel, that's essentially uh, the prediction then based on the Mayo classification. And then in the right is if we incorporate uh, total cyst number and cyst parenchyma surface area. And what's particularly interesting is you can see basically this red point is this patient, this is that red patient. And if we incorporate cyst number and cyst parenchyma, now we essentially start to really shift how those patients uh, would, their trajectory is gonna look uh, in this model. So, so far we're really looking at, you know, what's the utility of these new image biomarkers. And I think there's a lot of opportunity of, you know, building more, more refined models. Uh, one thing I just wanted to highlight um, is that uh, we've extended this work also to, to looking at uh, liver cyst segmentations. Uh, don't have a lot of uh, results of the utility just yet, but that's a, a place that we're uh, certainly exploring. So then um, let's go beyond TKV. Um, so obviously the story uh, is more complicated, right? And we've heard a lot about uh, the differences uh, in terms of, you know, complex versus simple cysts, um, obviously large versus small cysts, and really these questions of the heterogeneity or homogeneity uh, of the renal uh, tissue. And so again, you know, something we've been looking at then is uh, some uh, quantitative MR techniques uh, for example, diffusion weighted um, magnetization transfer, uh, as well as MR elastography. Um, and we've also um, done some investigations with uh, 40 flow imaging, uh, really with the idea of trying to automate uh, the measurement of renal blood flow, which is a very difficult uh, measurement to standardize. And I think this piggybacks well off of uh, what Karosh was showing with uh, the examples of the T1 and T2 images and these ideas of what we can maybe do in a sort of multi-parametric sense with the images uh, to not only, you know, different, you know, like I showed before, just differentiate and, and assign a number of cysts, but do things like classify the cysts. So one idea we have is to incorporate, for example, the T1 and T2 images and start to automatically differentiate simple from proteinaceous cysts. And I just wanted to highlight uh, some examples here uh, where we can essentially use the same uh, framework for that instance level segmentation um, and segment out the, the proteinaceous cysts uh, in the T1 images and now probably go further in terms of what's number of simple cysts, what's number of hemorrhagic, et cetera. And here's just another example. Um, so that's, you know, that's a lot of the, the work then uh, in terms of, of what we've done with automating a lot of these measurements in PKD. Um, I think the only, I think maybe, yeah, two things if I can quickly get through it. Um, is one is, you know, we're thinking beyond the kidney as well. Um, I think we've touched a lot on the utility of MR, but we're thinking about, you know, what, what can we do in the setting of CT? Um, and there's obviously been a lot of work now looking at things like body composition, uh, whether other, you know, organ involvement is of interest. Um, so just kind of wanted to highlight um, our, our work in this space in case there's, you know, interest or ideas around this, but essentially we're curating, you know, a large uh, data set of CT images as well, um, trying to do, uh, you know, tackle as many of kind of the segmentation tasks as possible here. Uh, we have developed an automated kidney, liver, and spleen model uh, in the setting of PKD, as well as applying uh, automated body composition analysis as well. Um, I think in the interest of time, um, yeah, I was just going to highlight, you know, a lot of these uh, tools we've obviously extended beyond uh, PKD, which could probably circle back to this setting as well. Um, so we've worked a lot on uh, doing things like automating our routine exams for, for renal donor workups and doing things like uh, differentiating cortex from, from um, medulla as well. 
um, and then trying to do things like classification of, of tumors as well. So this is uh, some ongoing work that I think uh, also would have a lot of utility uh, back in, in PKD. So I think with that, a um, lot of people to acknowledge. I really thank you all for your attention and certainly welcome any questions uh, when there's time. Uh, so thank you. I, I do. I don't know if you do you have the quiz or all right. Would have the after lunch? Okay, perfect. All right. So this question is: measurement of total kidney volume is most accurate when using blank imaging and blank measurements. The potential answers are ultrasound and ellipsoid-based measurements, CT and stereology-based measurements, MR and ellipsoid-based, and MR and planimetry. Or E, all of the above. No. That doesn't mean. I think so. That's good. So it, it was planimetry. Um, so we're really we're really trying to move towards uh, doing kind of that full segmentation of the kidneys. The the ellipsoid based is really just a couple measurements, and then you're kind of approximating uh, the volume. <clears throat> um, so let's see. Yeah, next question. All right, so this one is an instance level cyst segmentation algorithm is unique in that it can provide information about organ volume, cyst volume, cyst number, or image texture. Ooh, Tim needs to uh, be a better educator. <laughs> yeah, so the nuance there was really the instance part, and that's uh, what allows us to do cis number. Um, so cis volume, that was kind of the, the trick there. Sorry about that. But yeah, so in, it, these instance level segmentations are, are kind of unique in medical imaging. There's actually not of a lot of areas where you would try to do something like what we're trying to do um, in PKD, but really that instance level or, or the tool that we had developed, I think that the real uh, unique aspect is that we can get us stuff like cis number and size distributions. So, all right, thank you guys. <laughs>